Good morning, church. So we are going to continue in our sermon series that we have been in from 1 Peter called Keys to the Kingdom. And today we're talking about the marriage key. Now, I've got some quotes here on marriage from names you may recognize. First one is Socrates. Socrates says, by all means, marry. If you get a good spouse, you'll become happy. If you get a bad one, you'll become a philosopher. Benjamin Franklin, keep your eyes wide open before marriage and half shut afterwards. Rita Rudner said, I love being married. It's so great to find that one special person you want to annoy for the rest of your life. And finally, Carol Burnett said, some mornings I wake up grouchy. Other mornings I just let him sleep in. (laughs) So there you go. Some bad jokes about marriage. Thankfully, nobody rushed up on stage to slap me because I told a bad joke about marriage. Uh, so I want to say a couple things here, first of all, that we're going to call this the purpose-driven marriage. I was looking at different Christian organizations. What do you say is the purpose of marriage, like focus on the family, for instance? There's a lot of different answers, and I have to conclude there's no one purpose of marriage in the eyes of God, but so we're going to focus on what Peter has to say, and there are some purposes there in 1 Peter chapter 3. The other thing I want to say is about singles, about 40% of our congregation is not married, either never been married or widowed or divorced. And two things there, first of all, while it is certainly within the purposes of God, the will of God to be married or to desire marriage, uh, it is also perfectly within the will of God to be single. And there are advantages even to being a single Christian and serving the Lord in that state. Paul writes over in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul says, those who marry will have trouble in this life. No amens to that. I'm just not allowed to say amen right there. So don't worry about if you're single, that's fine. If you want to get married, that's fine. But whatever state we're in, it's it's blessed by God. If a person who is single does decide to marry, the one instruction that Paul gives is make sure that person that you're going to marry is a Christian. He says this about widows whose husbands have died. They're free to marry anyone they want to, but he must belong to the Lord. But moving on, basically we've got two headings here. Peter says something for purpose-driven wives and then something for purpose-driven husbands. We're going to say two things for each. Before we get to what Peter writes, just a word of caution, a word of warning. I know how these things work. When the preacher types, start teaching on marriage, then when he's dealing with the wives, who listens the hardest? The husband's. And when he's talking about the husbands, the wives are listening real hard so that the next time you have an argument, the husband can whip out those wife verses and beat on her, and the wife can get out the husband verses and beat on him. So we're going to start with the wives this morning. You husbands can tune out. You have my permission to take a power nap for about the next 10 minutes. Some of you already started. You don't even need my permission. But here we go. Two things for purpose-driven wives. Number one, submission. Submission. 1 Peter 3, 1, you wives be submissive to your own husbands so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. And so I know this can be a trigger to some, but this is why I call this a purpose-driven submission because it has a redemptive purpose. And Peter is addressing particularly those women who had converted to Christianity, but their husbands had not necessarily done so. He says one of the best ways to influence them is through our attitude, right? our character. It's like we just sang a song, the whole world needs to know, God, make me more like Jesus. The world, there's a connection there between us being Christ-like and their receptivity to the message of the gospel. And I think that's not only true in a wife-husband relationship, that may be true in the majority of family relationships. If we're trying to influence a parent, if we're trying to influence a grown child or a sibling, there is a point at which scriptural arguments just become nagging. And I know that's another loaded word, but it causes the other person simply to become defensive, whereas living as a Christian with a Christian attitude in our hearts breaks down defenses and makes person, a person more receptive. As someone has said, preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. 
And I think that's not true in all circumstances, but it is true in this particular circumstance. He continues for purpose-driven wives. What does that submission look like? It looks like a beautiful spirit, beauty, verses 3 through 6. Don't let your beauty be merely external, braiding the hair, wearing gold jewelry, or putting on dresses. This is not Peter forbidding braiding hair. He's not forbidding jewelry because he says, or putting on clothes or putting on dresses. It's literally putting on clothes. Obviously, he's not forbidding women to wear clothes. And what he says there about dresses is also applicable to the braids, it's to the jewelry. He's simply saying, don't make this the focus of our efforts. It's fine for a wife to want to look her best for her husband. Not to be vain about that, make it the main focus. The main focus is what he says here, the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, the former times, the holy women also who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you've become her children if you do what is right, without being frightened by any fear. The word gentle here is used of a, a, whore, a wild horse that's tamed and now is under control. It came to be used of strength under control. The quiet spirit was one that did not have to retaliate. Now, this is not necessarily just speaking of an introverted character. An extrovert or an introvert can have the gentle and the quiet spirit. I want to look at the first marriage here, Adam and Eve, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, these are arch archetypes, right? How is Eve a helper suitable for Adam? The word that is used there for helper in the Old Testament, original language is ezer, E-Z-E-R. And it was used most often as a description or a name for God, for God. God is the ezer, the helper. In Exodus chapter 18, Moses named his second son Eli Ezer, Eli Ezer. God is my helper. Why did he do that? He says this. Exodus 18, 4, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. So obviously, this is not talking about inferior, superior. We're talking about God was Moses' easer, his helper, and in the same way, a wife is a helper to her husband. He says suitable here, suitable, compatible, providing encouragement and strength. Some areas where the husband is weak, the wife is strong, and vice versa. She is a helper to him in that way. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 6. I have 3, verse 6. Oh, thank you for correcting that for me, Justin. Do what is right without being frightened by any fear. So we realize that what Peter is teaching here is not necessarily in alignment with modern feminist doctrine. We get that. So there may be some tension. But surely by now, it's evident to everyone what the end game of modern feminist doctrine is, which is the total erasure of all differences between the sexes. That's the goal. That's what we're seeing play out in our society. And we must never accommodate biblical teaching to either social or scientific theory. Social theory, scientific theory constantly change, but the Word of God remains forever. And we simply have to decide what voice are we going to listen to when it comes to structuring our lives, the dynamics of our interpersonal relationships in our family. Are we going to listen to cultural influencers of the day, or are we going to listen to the Word of God? This whole submission thing, does that mean that I have to be a doormat? Larry Crabb is a Christian counselor and author and minister, and he's counseled thousands and thousands of couples, has written several books. I like the way he puts it. He said, a woman once asked me if she should submit to a husband who wanted her to have sex with another man. I replied, of course, submit in everything. Tell him no quietly and gently. 
Another woman asked me if she should co-sign loan papers that she knew contained misinformation. Her husband wanted her to sign. Should she submit? He said, I answered yes, submit and everything. Refuse to sign gently and quietly. Do you see what he's saying here? Now, what we're talking about is a matter of attitude. Having a gentle and quiet, loving, respectful attitude toward a husband. Because ultimately, bottom line, this is what is precious in the eyes of God. It's a lordship issue. This is what is pleasing to God. Wives, you can go and take your power nap now. Before you do, elbow your husband, wake him up. Time for you guys to come back and tune in. Let's talk about what Peter says to purpose-driven husbands. Number one, two things. Number one, understanding. Understanding. First part of verse 7. And you husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker since she is a woman. The word here, understanding, is literally knowledge. He's saying live with knowledge with your wives. What is that referring to? It's referring to a husband having the knowledge of how a marriage and a family is supposed to work in the eyes of God, having that knowledge. That's what the husband is accountable for, to live with knowledge. You know, in that that first marriage, Adam and Eve, when it went sideways in the Garden of Eden, God came down and began walking through the garden, and he's looking for the couple. He's calling out a name. Whose name was he calling? Adam. He's calling, Adam. Why Adam? Who was it that ate the forbidden fruit first? It was Eve. It was Eve. And then she turned and gave some to her husband, the Bible says, who was standing there. In other words, during that entire interchange between Eve and the serpent, Adam was standing there saying nothing passively. And then he ate the fruit. And when God came down, he was looking for Adam because Adam was accountable for that marriage and that family. The word husband comes from the combination of two words, house and band. House, band, husband. The husband is the band that holds that home, that family, and that marriage together in the eyes of God. And he is accountable to God to understand, to have an understanding and a knowledge how this is supposed to work, how God expects it to work and operate accordingly. And so then we naturally have to ask the question, do I? Do we have that knowledge? Now, some, some, some men seem to come by this quite naturally. They're, they're just intuitively, they sense or understand how to be a great husband, how to be a great father, and maybe they had wonderful role models. They've never cracked a book. They don't even have to read the Bible. They just get it. That's none of you men. All right, that's none of you men this morning. I'm going to make a recommendation. I mean, you're great men above average. I heard a statistic last week. The average man in America will not read one book this year. But not this church because we're all above average by definition of being here. I want to recommend that men, we read a book, a Christian book on biblical marriage and biblical family. That's what I want to recommend. And I have two to show to you today and suggest. The first one is You and Me Forever by Francis and Lisa Chan. The second one is A Lifelong Love by Gary Thomas. I've probably read scores of books on marriage and on family. I go back and forth on these two as being the best book on marriage, Christian marriage, that I've ever read. Sometimes I say it's A Lifelong Love. Sometimes I say it's You and Me Forever. But these are the top two, in my opinion, that I would recommend that you read. What, what authors like this are able to do? These are gifted authors. I think God has given authors like Francis Chan, Gary Thomas, and Lisa Chan, has given those to the church body at large. Gifted authors like that can synthesize and distill the biblical teaching on marriage and family, put that in a book form so that when we read it, it has a transformative impact upon us. Guys, now I know the women are napping right now, but they're actually paying very close attention. And I promise you that many of those wives inside 
are saying, yes, yes, please listen to Preacher Steve right now. Get that book. Read that book. We need to elevate our game as men who are accountable to live with understanding and knowledge with our, hus- with our wives. What about this business of uh, someone weaker since she is a woman? What does that mean? I'm not sure. I read a lot of commentaries on this or a lot of theories on it. And maybe nothing more than recognizing the physical differences between men and women. Leah Thomas has certainly driven that home in our day and age. Why does Leah Thomas have all those championships and that record, those records? Because men are stronger than women. Now that's a generality, that's a generality. There are certainly some women who are stronger than some men. There are some wives who are physically stronger than some husbands, but we're just speaking in generalities. It could be just that. I'm not going to dwell on it. I don't think it's that important, but I like what theologian Jack Cottrell has to say about it. He says this, how must the husband fill this role of the stronger vessel? First, by rejecting the idea that he is the boss and the wife is his slave, by refusing to domineer over his wife and exploit her in any way, such behavior is pure selfishness. Second, by devoting himself to unselfish care and concern for his wife, by providing loving leadership and protection like Christ has done for the church. In other words, he must see his wife as a weaker vessel in the sense of a delicate and precious vase rather than an old crock. There you go. That's Jack Cottrell. Second thing here this morning for purpose-driven husbands is honor. Honor. Show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. He uses the same word here as he does in chapter 2, verse 17, where he says, honor the emperor. Same thing. Honor your wife. That's how it works in my house. When Tammy suggests that I do something, I say, yes, your honor. There we go. The Babylon Bee, I don't know if any of you read the Babylon Bee, has a handful of suggestions for uh, how to honor your wife, men. Number one, rinse a dish and leave it near the sink. Your lady will swoon when she sees how considerate you are. Number two, place excess trash in an organized pile near the trash can until she can take it out. Number three, (laughs) helpfully gather all the dirty clothes and passive-aggressively place them in front of the washing machine. Whatever you do, don't actually put them in the washer. You'll probably do it wrong. Number four, leave her helpful instructions on sticky notes around the house so she'll know how to do things properly. You can add little hearts and X's and O's for extra romance. Number five, say helpful phrases when she's cleaning like, my mom didn't do it that way. (laughs) Wives love to learn new things from their mothers-in-law. What better way to pass on generational information? Number six, start the lawnmower for her. Use your big man strength to start the mower so she has more energy to mow the lawn. If you really want to drive her crazy, roll up your sleeves so she sees your big arms while you crank the engine. I like that one. Number seven, pick up your feet while playing Xbox so she can vacuum underneath them. Invest in your marriage and do it without being asked. All right, Babylon B. Well, actually, it's probably just the opposite of all of those things. But there are critics who say that if Christians had their way, wives would be be like in a handmaid's tale, and they'd all be under the thumb of their husbands being oppressed. And actually, historically, that, that could not be further from the truth. Let me give you a real brief description of what the status of women was, wives were, in the time, in the culture, into which Peter wrote and Paul wrote and Jesus taught. In every sphere of ancient civilization, women had no rights at all. In Greek civilization, the duty of the woman was to remain indoors and be obedient to her husband. It was the sign of a good woman that she must see as little, hear as little, and ask as little as possible. She had no kind of independent existence and no kind of mind of her own. Her husband could divorce her almost at caprice so long as he returned her dowry. That's Greek law. Under Roman law. A woman had no rights. In law, she remained forever a child. When she was under her father, she was under the patria potestis, that's the father's power, which gave the father the right even of life and death over her. When she married, she passed into the power of her husband. She was entirely subject to her husband and completely at his mercy. Cato the censor, the typical ancient Roman wrote, if you were to catch your wife in an act of infidelity, you can kill her with impunity and without a trial. 
the whole attitude of ancient civilization was that no woman could dare take any decision for herself. Think women under the Taliban today. That was the status of women in ancient Greek and Roman culture into that dark environment shown the brilliant light of the teachings of Jesus, the teachings of Paul, the teachings of Peter with statements like this, honor your wife as a fellow heir of the gospel. As Christianity took root, the Western civilization changed, as did the status of woman, women, which was elevated in every society where Christianity permeated. We only have to look right now at societies where Christianity is not dominant to see what the status of women is when that influence is not felt. Neither better, both equal, and seeing each other in heaven. The slap heard round the world. You know, the, the way to honor one's wife is not to slap someone who's telling a joke supposedly in her disfavor. I like what Benjamin Warfield did. Benjamin Warfield was a theologian of a past generation. His books are still read by seminary students today. He got married at the age of 25. He and his wife went on a honeymoon in Germany. On their honeymoon, she was struck by lightning and permanently paralyzed. Permanently paralyzed on their honeymoon. He took care of her for the next 39 years. Now, here's a theologian, and he teaches at Princeton. But he took care of her for the next 39 years until she passed away. Her care required that he be present in the home. He could rarely leave for more than two hours at a time. After she died, he was asked about it. He said, I promise to love and honor her until death do us part. And that's what I did. And he said, I'm sure if the roles had been reversed, she would have done the same for me. That's how a husband honors a wife. 